it's weird, eh? Yeah. It was yours, you brought it from home? Yeah. Well, you know. And I was just putting my Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, or good morning, or good evening, depending on what time zone you feel like you're in. Uh, my name is Cassandra Extavor. I'm one of the uh, organizers of the meeting, and I'm happy to be here and happy to welcome you all to this afternoon session, where we will first have two spectacular talks from members of our community, and then we'll have a panel discussion um, chaired by myself with four colleagues, and hopefully involving all of you to discuss the potential role of emerging model organisms in the study of climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. So our first of two speakers this afternoon is Dr. Ahab Abuhaif, a professor at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Go Canada. Um, and uh, Ahab is a very interesting evolutionary biologist who has worked on ants and sea urchins and hox genes and other flavors of transcription factors and really is someone who is studying organismal biology as a means to an end of understanding larger principles of evolutionary change and he's been of this mindset since he was a graduate student, which is what always makes his work so fascinating to study regardless of the organism. So I'm happy to welcome Ahab to the stage and I'll just remind before Ahab comes up, I'll remind those of you who are viewing on Zoom that you're welcome to ask questions for the speakers and also later on during the panel discussion via the chat and then our very own Catherine Brown, Editor-in-Chief, will be uh, reading out those questions so you, you can participate as well. All right, Ahab, please come up and delight us with your stories. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Cassandra, and thank you to the organizers of this meeting um, for allowing me the opportunity to address something I don't usually. It's, it's certainly not business as usual uh, in our ivory tower, um, just presenting the cutting edge research. This uh, meeting has uh, made me pause and, and try to synthesize things I usually don't. Uh, and so this is very much an experiment in progress. Uh, but what we're really trying to synthesize um, is, you know, the field of eco evo devo, ecology, evolution, and developmental biology, and of course try to address um, the pressing problem uh, of climate change. Now, most of the, uh, the issue, of course, most of the approaches are uh, at current at play are, of course, eco-evo approaches. And that's normally the idea that the majority of scientists addressing the problem of climate change are doing so by thinking about genetic potential of populations and the risk of extinction. How much variation is there in populations? Uh, can they go extinct? But certainly uh, haven't thought about the devo component uh, in trying to address this problem. Now I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to try and do for the next 25 minutes, uh, and that is to maybe advance a stark, perhaps controversial proposal that we can discuss in the discussion section and, and perhaps have some, uh, some discussion uh, after my talk as well. But the idea is, of course, the proposal is that developmental systems may promote phenotypic innovation and complexity in the face of environmental stress induced by climate change. So developmental systems, by accounting for them, may actually promote innovation, okay? In light of the fact that, of course, we're losing biodiversity at an incredibly fast pace. And so it's a paradox that we will discuss throughout the talk. Okay, so phenotypic innovation and complexity. Now, um, we don't really have a good understanding uh, of how to quantify complexity in, in, in organismal systems. Um, the best we've been able to do, the, the, kind of the, the most accepted definition, I would say, is one to define complexity by the number of parts or holes, as Dan McShay would say, in a complex system. And, and what at least developmental biologists have been really taking to heart is, of course, looking at the number of cell types in an organism. So if we, the only kind of, this was uh, advanced by John Tyler Bonner in the early 80s and 90s, where if you map the number of cell types versus organismal size by the total number of cells, you get a positive relationship by the number of cell types and the total number of cells. We don't really understand how this, I mean, this, we're very far away from understanding what, how this particular uh, relationship holds. 
Now, one could very argue, of course, that there are complexity at different levels. But what I'm going to present to you today, at least, is one way of grappling with this problem, and that is, of course, looking at my, my favorite group, the ants. Okay? And ants are incredibly di diverse and morphologically successful group. There are about 20,000 species in a single family. And according to uh, recent studies, if you take all humans and put them in one blob and ants in another blob, they would be somewhat equivalent blobs. I think ants come up the winner in the recent studies, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that success uh, is largely that ants are eusocial and they have remarkable degrees of cooperation and division of labor between a reproductive queen and non-reproductive workers, and of course, uh, workers uh, dividing tasks among each other to, uh, to, to take care of the colony. But another very important uh, reason that ants are um, successful is they don't only divide tasks by behavior, but they also ta divide tasks by caste, or ca what I call caste types. And so, of course, ants are polyphenic, and that's another reason for their success, is that they live, uh, these, two, uh, these two individuals live in a single colony, the queen and the worker. Now, the difference between them is dramatic. If a, when a queen lays an egg, that egg can either develop into a queen or a worker, depending on the environment it's in, the nutrition, temperature, and social interactions. And if it develops into a, a queen, it will, could live from 25 to 30 years, can develop fully functional wings and lay millions of eggs, thousands to millions or hundreds to millions. Right? And, and if you, uh, and, but if you don't get the right cues, you become a worker, uh, you're completely wingless, you're non-reproductive, and you only live a few months. So the same genes can produce something that lives either 30 years or three months. Okay, uh, now, the queens uh, use these wings to fly off for their mating flights. Let me just turn on this video quick. This is from my backyard in Montreal. Uh, just if you catch a mating flight, you can see the queens with the wings here and the workers. It's, a, it's just it's one time of the year, uh, you know, just uh, two hours, one time a year, they fly up in the air. You can see them flying. They use their wings. The males and the queens, they fly up to mate in the air. The males die. They're only good for their sperm. They live for two months. <laughs> the queen then rips off her wings and finds a new place to found her new colony. Okay? Now, um, so that's the life cycle of an ant. Now, the more important thing for us here is the concept that was forwarded by William Morton Wheeler in 1911, the notion that you can think of an ant colony as a super organism. Okay? The idea that just like in a uh, multicellular organism, you have germline, sperm and egg, and a soma that divide labor among themselves. In a single colony, of course, the germline is the queen and the male that go up for their mating flights. And then you have the soma that, of course, divide labor and do their tasks. And so they really, when they live in a single colony, they act as a super organism. And just like you have, uh, of course, this is uh, you know, sort of a... Um, uh, a fate map of, the, uh, of, uh, of humans. Of course, you start with a pluripotent, totipotent cell that as development proceeds, of course, you get differentiation of uh, cell types uh, with time to give rise to the 100 plus cell types you have in the human body. And the way we think about it in a superorganism, of course, is you have that single genome that gives rise to uh, different cast types uh, with time. In, in, in the superorganism. And so you have cell type poly, polyphenism and cast type polyphenism. Now, the way we measure then uh, superorganism complexity is when you have, of course, we count the number of different cast types. We count the number of queen cast types. We count the number of male cast types. Task, uh, we see the, the, the more. The, the, there is a division of labor uh, by task, and you know the, the stricter the reproductive division of labor, the larger the colony size, all of these. So the higher the number of all of these things, we would count as a more complex superorganism. Okay, and you would we, it's a somewhat similar because the greater number of cell types would give us an indication that a multicellular organism is more complex. One with a hundred cell types would be more complex than one would say fifty. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of complexity of the number of worker cast types in a superorganism. And so if we look, uh, these are uh, very much um, reflective of uh, ancestral type characteristics of ants. Uh, the colonies at the sort of the origin of ants were small. 
there wasn't a very big division of labor between queens and workers. And then, uh, what Wilson and Holdobler, uh, E. Wilson and Holdobler, called the point of no return, you then get a large size dimorphism evolving between queens and workers. Um, and so, and, and now colony sizes go from 40 to 50 to hundreds to thousands. But the workers are all the, the, you know, look the same. And so this would be an advance, a sort of a change in complexity in, in worker caste. But then of course you have now the worker caste itself splitting not just from a single worker caste to now two different, uh, multiple worker caste types. Okay, so here you have in a leaf cutter ant uh, who invented agriculture you know, 10 million years ago, you have now the small worker and, and large soldier that live in a single colony. And this innovation of larger, you know, greater number of caste types, so we have a greater superorganism complexity, is associated with now ecological dominance and success, or evolutionary success. So you have here a single colony. You can see how massive this is from a single queen of leafcutter ant, and this is in Texas. This is by Lawrence Allen Smith, clearing all, this is the colonies right in the center. It clears everything around it in, the, in, in, the, in, in, in where it's going. So this association with an increased number of worker caste types has a great ecological and evolutionary success. And of course, uh, they've diversified into a number of different castes. These are carpenter ants, uh, which of course are very successful, a hyperdiverse ant genus, from the smallest worker to the largest soldier, the army ants, and the big-headed ants, all very successful uh, ants. And so these would be considered worker polymorphic, or ants that have now crossed that threshold to being more complex superorganisms. And so uh, if we consider, uh, this, this is the state I showed you where all workers are the same size, it's called monomorphic, and we're gonna just, for the purposes of what we're thinking about, any kind of now size differences between the inter-individual variation and the worker caste, we'll call that polymorphic and we'll consider that a more complex state. Okay, so now if I ask you, if we step back for a second and I ask you, where is most of ant biodiversity concentrated? What would we say, okay? Just a wild guess. Okay, I'm talking to developmental biologists, but yes, tropics is the right answer, okay? <laughs> so tropics is where most if you just looked at ant species richness, so it doesn't matter whether they're all the same size or different sizes, if you just take all the ants in the world that we know about and put their geographic location, like most vertebrates and other organisms, they're gonna be found mostly in the tropics, okay? But now, if I ask the question, where are the most phenotypically complex superorganisms located? So if we use the splitting of a single worker caste into different worker caste types, like we would have more cell types in a multicellular organism, where would we find them? We're gonna find them in the tropics? We don't, this is a big surprise. When we plotted, this is a study we did in 20, uh, 2022, when we plotted uh, you know, 8,990 8, ant species, uh, given two, you know, whatever, 200,000 locations, um, it turns out that if you look at the probability of polymorphism, they are located in the most arid and dry places in the world, the hottest places in the world. So if we look here, uh, just another way of looking at it, so this is just the different biomes in the world. I want you to focus on the yellow, because the yellow is essentially the desert, okay? And if we plot it, you can see that if you have a probability of polymorphism, it's the desert that has the greatest number of complex superorganisms or the ants. And if you look over here, as a function of temperature, um, so if you have the least precipitation and the highest temperature, that's this point is where you find the most complex superorganisms. So this raises a bit of a paradox, okay? Um, although ongoing climate change leads to aridification, increasing frequency and intensities of fires and droughts, okay? Uh, we lose biodiversity. Of course, this leads to loss of biodiversity and extinction. But at the same time, if arid systems are hotspots of phenotypic complexity, then this may promote developmental and phenotypic innovation if they can adapt, okay? So that's the paradox we're gonna think about and we'll, we'll just kind of go through um, some systems. We've made now some progress on trying to figure out how you get these big soldiers evolving in the first place, the developmental mechanisms of how you get these big soldiers to evolve in the first place and these big-headed ants from the genus Phytoli. 
Okay, and if you look at the genus Phaidoli, you have a small minor worker and a large-headed soldier. Uh, these are the pupae. They're just easier to look at. Oh, jeez, when ants... I know, I know. There you go, sorry. <laughs> at least I can... <laughs> okay, we'll just pause that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the, the small-headed minor worker, okay, uh, they, um, they do most of the tasks in the colony, and the large-headed soldiers are mainly for cracking seeds and in defense. And if you were to plot head width versus body length, you get clear two different lines with a big gap in the middle. Okay? So these are really two discrete castes. They're two different worker caste types that I, I would call them. Okay, um, okay and now after that... Uh, Hello. Ah, here we go. Okay. So we know uh, from work of Diana Wheeler and Fred Nyhout at Duke, uh, we know a lot about the way these things are, 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 are done. So if you, uh, if the, when an egg is laid by the queen, if it's, fer if it's not fertilized, it becomes haploid and male. This is to, to scale. If it is fertilized, um, then it, they, they become female. And if there is, uh, if it's fated to become a queen, if the queen experiences the right temperature and photo period. The hormone is released in the abdomen of the queen, and the eggs that are laid then go on to become queens. And these, what you're seeing in red, these are the wing imaginal discs or the wing precursors. And these will grow to be fully functional uh, wing imaginal discs. And, and you can really, there's a big difference between that. If it goes, if we continue on to develop, this is quite late, this is the last larval instar. If you get the right protein, you'll come on to become a soldier. And although it, the workers are completely wingless, so of the 15,000 species of ants, none of them have wings, you still develop these little wing rudiments you can see in red. If you become a worker, you don't see any of these rudiments. Now, I have studied uh, for the last uh, 20 years, um, I've been trying to get an, a handle on uh, the wing polyphenism in ants, and so I've been studying this, uh, this network of genes, uh, developmental genes, that Drosophila geneticists have elegantly worked out. And for the most part, when the males and the queens develop wings, this network is completely conserved and functional. And this is just basically one of the uh, fundamental pillars of EvoDevo, that of course we have these, these genetic toolkit of genes that has been largely conserved uh, for, um, you know, for probably even before the split of plants and animals, some genes, and the others for at least animals. And that's going to play an important role for our next story when we come in. And then I asked the question, well, okay, if they're completely conserved here, how are these networks halted to give rise to the miners and soldiers? And I've been doing this for 20 years. And, you know, but one thing I've, I've always puzzled me is that the wing rudiment, if you, these are nano CT scans, I highly recommend this. These are like really uh, beautiful scans. This is just after the soldier has been determined. So this is a larvae right after the soldier has been determined all the way to just before it's about to uh, become a pupae. And something quite remarkable is if you look at this little rudiment, I mean, it's a rudiment. It's not, it doesn't produce a wing. It just kind of pops out. I thought it was a neutral kind of thing before. Um, but if you see it, it actually grows to quite a large size. It expresses most of that gene regulatory network. It's coordinated with, uh, you know, once it grows to about this size, it then it apoptoses and becomes, it, it, it goes down to cell death. And so it's a very coordinated response. You become a soldier, it grows like crazy, and even faster than the, the discs in the males and queens, and then it kind of shuts down. And I think, well, if it's, a, it's a, a rudimentary thing, why would it do that? If it's just a true vestige of, an, of a wing, why would it do that? The other thing that's quite striking is if you look at another Phaidoli species, um, which have... Um, not just a, a, about eight species out of a thousand species in this genus have a third additional cast called the super soldier cast. It's my favorite. These are like, I, I could talk about these forever. Um, but here, there was a striking correlation. The minor workers have no visible wing discs. The soldiers have one. And the super soldiers have these two massive rudimentary discs. Again, why would they do this? If you look at... Um, and, and so all of this is coordinated growth of this rudimentary disc. It's automatic, it's coordinated shutdown. The correlation with being a minor worker, a soldier, and a super soldier got me to rethink this kind of textbook idea we have of vestiges and rudiments. I mean, if we think of, 
you know, basically little tails uh, in humans or the webbing. We, we basically, when we're born, we have little webs between our fingers. Um, and in this case, the rudimentary wing, we think of them, the vestiges as some things that are, don't have function. So they're useless. They're just remnants of history or indicators of ancestry. But we really started to think, given all of this, that maybe there's something going on there. We should, we should really look at it. And so we asked the question, what, what, does this rudimentary forewing disk have any function or does it play any role? And, and we tested this with a remarkable team of graduate students led by Rajendran Rajkumar, who's now a professor at the University of Ottawa. So what we did uh, is we decided to look at the gene vestigial because vestigial is a you know, what you would call a master regulatory gene, if anybody believes in that term. But, uh, you know, let's just say it's a, it plays an important role in regulating pattern growth and differentiation of the wings. And if you look at uh, the queens or males, uh, this is uh, an expression all around the, uh, basically, the border, um, dorsal ventral boundary of the wing disc. And this is conserved relative to Drosophila. And if you look at the vestige, you also have a conserved expression in the, in the, in the wing disc. And so what we did is we just uh, basically, we just waited till the larvae got the right signal. It's a protein. This is a nutritional switch. So if it gets enough protein, it becomes a soldier. If not, it becomes a minor worker. We just waited till the larvae switched, and then we hit it with vestigial RNAi. And vestigial is specifically expressed in the wings. It's one of, like I said, it's kind of, if you express in Drosophila, if you express vestigial in the, in the legs, you'll turn legs into wings, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, so we waited to do that. And when we did that, relative to the control, we were able to actually halt the growth of this little rudiment uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the soldiers. And, you know, I didn't know really what to expect uh, when, when this happened. Um, but this, I, I would say, and, you know, because my Rajendran Rajakumar, uh, he's half Irish, half Indian. And so we call this the holy samosa moment of my scientific <laughs> career in which... <laughs> When we did it, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I thought we might delay development or something might happen. But here is a control worker, and this is a control soldier. Okay? When we hit this rudimentary wing, we actually made the head smaller and the body size smaller. So this little wing rudiment actually makes the head smaller and the body size smaller. So it's been co-opted or repurposed in evolution to send some kind of signals to regulate the head and the body. And if you, and, and, and ants, this is it. I mean, uh, the thing that varies the most across ants, the two characters, are head and body length. So this is really, um, I think if you look, if you let them grow to adults, they'll grow. That's again a wild type worker, wild type soldier. And you can see uh, we've messed with the, uh, we've made this intermediate uh, soldier. So what that means, uh, if we synthesize uh, this, it just, the, you given the right kind of protein, that will release JH, uh, juvenile hormone. Uh, this will activate the growth, will induce the growth of this rudimentary wing in the network inside. And this will somehow either send signals to the head and body, and this which will then uh, make the soldier. Okay? And so this worker cast type now, we've sort of gotten uh, a, a real handle, at least you know, we've, we've now knocked it out in other species with soldiers, and we've been able to make their heads smaller. And so really this thing has been repurposed in ant evolution to make the... Um, I think the soldier cast. And with one of my other graduates, since Angelica uh, Liliko Uashur, um, we summarized our own data as well as 100 years of data in Fidoli, lots of natural history out there, to try and figure out almost like a, a call, like a, a sort of a regulatory network, like a network outside of a network, right? So you have lots of social interactions that when there are too many soldiers, the soldiers will release an inhibitory pheromone that stop this disc from growing and stopping more soldiers from coming out, and they can balance the ratio from 5 to 95%. So most of the workers are about 95%, the soldiers are 5%. And there's, of course, effects of nutrition, resources, competition, seasonal cues, colony size, and so on and so forth. But now, now we can ask the question, if most of the complex superorganisms are out there, are in the hot and arid regions, the question then begs itself, how is climate change and this aridification of habitats somehow affecting this complex regulation, both colony regulation and disc regulation, to favor the evolution of more you know, complex caste types? Okay? 
And this is, you know, we have a handle on it in, in, in ants, but uh, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe this is the same way for other complex organisms. Okay, we'll take a breather, just let's breathe. And uh, just, uh, just a, a pause, uh, an advertisement. So my grad student, Anjali vasquez Correa is here, and she's a poster number 40, and she'll present a really cool ant eco evo divo. So check out her poster. Okay, back to, uh, thank you to the sponsors. Now back to uh, whatever. Um, okay, so I just gave you an idea. Uh, when we use worker cast types as a proxy, we see, you know, of course, more super. Another way I told you was the number of queen cast types. Okay, so sometimes in ant evolution, it wasn't the worker cast. Remember, I showed you this diagram. This is from the genus, the New World genus Monomorium. And in here in Monomorium, it wasn't the worker cast. They, all the workers are pretty much the same. It wasn't the workers that diversified into new cast types. This time, it was actually the queen. And so in this particular uh, species, uh, uh, Monomorium emersoni, you got the evolution of winged and wingless queens. Okay. And the worker caste is pretty much similar. So now you've got a diversification or a splitting. And these, they can grow anywhere from, uh, you could have um, anywhere from one queen to like two to three hundred. Okay? And sometimes, it depends, they're mixed. Sometimes you find queens that are all winged. Sometimes you find colonies with all wingless. And you sometimes you find them mixed. Okay? Okay. And in a similar way to Fidoli, uh, again, if it's, uh, the egg is laid and it's not fertilized, it becomes male. If it isn't, it becomes female. And then it's a juvenile hormone switch that makes the difference between a queen and a worker. And then here we haven't quite figured it out, but it's, I, I, you know, I suppose it's a mix of genetic and environmental factors that will make either a winged queen or a wingless queen, although I think it's environmental mostly. But we still have to, we still have to do experiments to confirm that. Okay, and again, like in Fidoli, if you, these are the larvae, this is the wing queen, this is the wingless queen. If you look here, oh boy, um, you, have, uh, you have the fully, uh, you have fully functional wing disc, here you have these rudiments again, and then the worker, we have nothing. Okay, and uh, look, I'm just gonna skip, since I have five minutes, I'm just gonna go right to the end. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid. Um, uh, well, you know, okay, all right. But I just, okay, I have to show you this, I don't care. The, where these exist are the Arizona Sky Islands. It's one of the most beautiful places in the entire world. I wish I could be there now. Well, no, this is a nice place, actually. <laughs> uh, this is like a, it's a gorgeous. The reason they call it a Sky Island is like, like oceanic islands, um, they're basically, all of this is desert, and then on the top of the mountains are green. So it's kind of like the organisms have sort of migrated to the tops, and they can't now get from one mountain to the other. There's Sky Islands. And about you know, uh, 90,000 years ago, um, these things were green. So this was about the Pleistocene, it was very cool. And then over till about 20,000 years ago, you can see now uh, you've got just some refuges. These are the Sky Islands, and the rest is all desert in between. Okay? And this is what it looks like. This is uh, just you know, desert at the bottom. Uh, it looks like here is some, some lush green. At the top, there's actually ice. And, this was one of my biggest disappointments in field work. I ran away from Canada in the winters of Canada to do field work in warm Arizona, and I ended up going to the top and finding snow. I mean, you know, uh, that was the thing. But anyway, the idea is that across this mountain, you find largely wingless queens at the bottom and wing queens at the top. And this pattern was repeated across all of the different sky islands. And uh, basically, the, the, the factor that explains to them the most is that as you go to the top, the, fragment, the habitats get fragmented and it's elevation and fragmentation of the habitats that explain the frequency of the wingless queens as you go to the top. And what we just saw is that as, if you go back to 150,000 years ago to the present, this is gene flow between the populations. What you can see is using sequence data, we could determine that the, the sort of the gene flow goes way down. And what we, what we saw is something really interesting as you, um, as you go from 150,000 years ago to the top, you first have a split between the northern group of sky islands and the southern group. There's like a splitting between those. They stop exchanging genes. And then after you get uh, further splits, so it's a sequential splitting of them stopping to exchange genes and, and gene flow. But here is the really interesting thing. Again, if we just look at this wing GRN, um, of course, just to say that in all of the wing queens, this wing GRN is completely conserved. But we wanted to know, the real question is, is this network interrupted in the same way across all five sky islands? So it's like kind of like 
you know, nature gave us the experiment. It's a replicated natural experiment where you have five sky islands. That it's repeated along each of the sky islands. And we want to know, did it interrupt it in the same way across those sky islands? And um, we, the first thing just to say is that we, I put these cartoons to make it easy because I knew I'd run out of time. Um, but the idea is that you, you know, some, you, you saw that, well, hey, look, some sky islands are similar to others. And if you look at those, it's actually, again, according to the splits, the southern and the northern sky islands. And again, what you're seeing is that the interruption points are following the gene flow, uh, you know, the splitting, those contacts, the splitting of the sky islands as it's getting warmer and warmer. And we see this pattern also for genes in the network that control muscles. So all, none of them have muscles. And again, you see this, uh, the pattern of genes, this is a gene called MEF2, uh, is split between the north and the south. So they're following the kind of the contact, the, the splitting. But the genes involved in patterning the wing are the same across all the sky islands. Okay? And then you have one gene that's responsible for hinge development called extradenical. Um, it, uh, if you look at the, there's these little vestigial hinges um, and the wing expression of vestigial also follow the, no, this, they don't follow any pattern. They kind of split, they started to diverge after all the splits happened. So it was once they'd all split, they started to, to go across. So what you see, of course, is this mix of determinism. Some genes in the network are the same. So there's this determinism. You need to stop the wing. You stop it in the same place across all. But others are a mosaic of this kind of population history that, like, you know, uh, of, the, of the sky islands. And it's just to say, I mean, what this means is that, and this is what I was saying before, that a pillar of Evo Devo, of course, is that, uh, you know, there's these highly conserved networks. And it was, I, I was unsure that, you know, would this network evolve fast enough to keep pace with these, you know, climate changes across, you know, from about 80,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago? And the answer is yes, which is a big surprise, that this network can evolve fast enough, okay, to follow the population splits, uh, some of the genes, uh, to, to follow these population splits of the Long Island, uh, Long Island, the uh, Sky Islands. And the other thing is just to say that the wingless queen is not just degeneration, you're not just losing a wing, it's a whole life history uh, syndrome. So you lose the wing, it's because the reason why you get the evolution of wingless queens when it gets warmer at, at fragmented habitats is because you know, a wing queen, when it flies, okay, it doesn't necessarily know what's going to land. But the wing queen, what it does is it grabs a bunch of workers from the colony, and it goes and it starts its own. It buds off the mother colony and goes starts another colony. It's called dependent colony foundation versus independent when each queen develops its wings and flies. So the idea is that there's a much higher rate of survival. It's a whole life history strategy to just take a bunch of workers and go and start a new colony. So with this new whole life history switch, you, you, you have... Um, a wing, you know, pattern. Anyway, just to say that it's getting hotter and hotter in the, in the Long Islands. And again, we just go back to this proposal to discuss in the panel session. And just to also say that these, this idea of stress-induced evolutionary innovation, there are some papers that are coming out by Gunter Wagner's group. Uh, I put the early multicellularity for Inyaki and others. And also this notion of HSP90 and and transposable elements, all things to discuss in the panel session. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Being flexible on yes. the fly there. <laughs> um, uh, while Kim sets up. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah, you do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to steal the Any money. questions for Aha, burning ones that can't wait until afterwards because we have a minute while Kim gets set up? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering here yeah. whether you can change body size by just transplanting one of these um, wing rudimentary discs. I want to do this experiment. <laughs> you know, have any grad students? Send them my way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. I'm kind of curious, with those kind of hybrid RNA ants, did you follow what happens with them in the colony? Does they accept them? 
And what role do they play? <laughs> I need another grad student. Send them my way. But that's a burning question. Are, do they behave more like soldiers? Do they behave more like minor workers? It's a real... Or a new cast. Or a new cast, exactly. Yeah. Very good. And one more right Yeah. Here. And the last one in, in the same line. If you overexpress this gene, do you make super, super soldiers? Oh, my God. I would love to do that, yeah. I mean, we either, like, you know, overexpress the gene. We could try, we're, like, we're trying to do now. I have a grad student in the lab who's trying to transplant wing this in and see if we can make super, super soldiers, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And on that terrifying note, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm excited to introduce Kim Cooper, who's working at the University of California, San Diego. Um, even though she has been approached by many other institutions, I happen to know, she remains in sunny San Diego and we can't blame her. So I'm looking forward to hearing about Kim's work. I met Kim for the first time when she was a postdoc at the Harvard Medical School. And it was obvious right away that Kim was gonna run a really successful independent program because she was always focused on the question. And she approached whatever technique and approach and knowledge was needed to focus on her question. She didn't limit herself to one approach. She needs histology, do it. She needs biomechanics, do it. She needs paleontology, do it. And you'll see this in the program that Kim is gonna tell you about now. So I'm excited to see her truly integrative biology program. Um, and she's chosen a really great model system to focus this on. Cassandra. That was perhaps the most generous introduction you could have given. And coming from you in particular, it's very appreciated. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm really excited to tell you about what my lab has been doing most recently and to try and put it into the context of loss of biodiversity. So I'm going to start by making the point that skeletal proportion is not only integral to an animal's form and function, because you can see that each of these species navigates its environment in a very, very, very different way, but skeletal proportion is also both modular and also highly evolvable. By modular, you can take your own limb, if you look at your arm, you can see that your hand bones are much shorter than your arm bones, but if you looked early during fetal development, those bones are much more similar to each other in size. And the way we get typical adult proportion is due to difficult, differential growth rates and duration of growth over the early development of, of uh, actually postnatal animal. Development does continue after birth. Um, and that skeletal proportion is also incredibly evolvable because you can imagine if we had plastic fingers and you grabbed one and you dragged it, you could get this disproportionately elongated, elongated finger bones of a bat. This is my species of choice. I'll throw down a challenge to get a reaction out of something else. Um, <laughs> This is actually slowed down quite substantially. These are obligate bipedal rodents. This is the lesser Egyptian gerboa native to North Africa and, and parts of Central Asia. Uh, they do have arms, but they're kind of tucked up underneath their chin. Uh, you'll see in a skeletal drawing a little bit later that they're kind of proportionate to the rest of the body like a mouse's limbs, but these hind limbs are incredibly long. And my daughter made me promise that I would reference a 1932 paper on bipedal rodent uh, morphology that called them potatoes on toothpicks. Because <laughs> at seven and a half, that's the part of my talk that she remembers. So one of the advantages of studying gerboas, I think really the biggest advantage of studying gerboas is that it is the most extreme limb skeleton among the closest relatives of mice. And if you're going to pick a laboratory reference species, the mouse is really it, because this is where we understand the most of the genetics that drive limb development. And, and if you look around at all the neighbors of mice, you have to get to a gerboa to find something that is this extreme. Their last common ancestor is about 50 million years ago. And so how has extreme skeletal proportion evolved? Now, to answer a question like this, what are the genetics that control skeletal proportion? And, and actually, I forgot this was in here. Typically, when I give a talk, I really like to give like an almost complete story that's not yet published. Um, it's not quite what you're going to get today is the making of the sausage. Um, I <laughs> had put this photo on a slide, and then Alex suggested that I put him up here and myself over here referencing the hands, but I wonder if he actually feels a little bit more like the meat. Um, he's due to graduate soon. Okay, so 
I make this point, I teach introductory evolution and ecology and students always talk in terms like, well, if an organism wants to do this or if, if this sort of thing is happening then, right? Um, the reality is evolution is stuff happens. And that stuff is the probability of a given genotype times the probability of a given environment occurring at the same time gives you the probability of an adaptation. And so the question is, what is the genotype that's causing the adaptive phenotype. If you work in a system that you have very different morphotypes or, or uh, physiologies that can interbreed with one another, then you have the great fortune of being able to cross those individuals and generate F1s and cross those and generate F2s and then do quantitative trait loci analyses and the system will tell you what are the genetics that are controlling that trait. But what if you're studying a system where your phenotypes have been diverging for more than 10 million or 20 million years? You can't breed them together. I've had, there are species of gerboas that are about two or three million years divergent. They do look very, very similar to one another. People will ask me if they interbreed and my response is, can you breed with a chimp? Because that's the same genetic distance. And so, in this kind of more meso macro evolutionary space, what's traditionally happened is, is I kind of think of it as the five blindfolded people with an elephant because each of them is feeling a different part of the elephant and so they're perceiving that what they're feeling is something very different. And so in the evolutionary genomic space, that's I have a candidate and I'm gonna look for differences in my candidate and lo and behold, I found a candidate difference and so it's a Hox gene or an FGF or a BMP it's structural variation, it's a protein coding sequence difference, it's a conserved non-coding sequence, or it's just like this dark matter in the genome. And this is by no means a criticism because I've done this as well, but the reason we've done this is because of limitations in our systems. Because you can't see the full genomic space. We don't have the genomes yet. We don't have the tools yet, but they are emerging right now and they're being applied to the whole genome evolution. And so I think we're gonna be able to see the entire elephant very soon because it's raining genomes. Um, there are currently alive estimated about 70,000 vertebrate species. To date, 520 species have been sequenced at what's considered high quality by the Vertebrate Genomes Project. There are other genomes, but I'm counting these that pass the highest quality threshold to be able to get information about whole genomes. Um, and as a discussion topic, I think it would be really interesting. I just came from the International Congress of Genetics and Genomics meeting that was in Melbourne. There was a huge representation of people in the biodiversity genomes uh, groups, the Vertebrate Genomes Project, the European Biodiversity Genome Project. Uh, and questions are out there about how are species prioritized? What do we do with genomes once we have them? because they're appearing at a very, very rapid, there are sequencers all over the world that if they're not sequencing human genomes and tumors, they're trying to find more species to sequence. And so what do we do with these genomes? We, uh, there are conversations about studying population diversity and conservation genetics, the genetics of climate adaptation, identifying species that might be uh, disease reservoirs, unusual cell biologies and physiologies that many of you are really interested in. Natural products discovery is no doubt sitting in these genomes. And then what I'm gonna talk about is this whole scale evolutionary genomics. But we have to move fast. And I know I'm preaching to the choir in this audience because we're all aware of loss of biodiversity. This is a figure that's showing the background rate of extinction over historic time. And then over the last 500-ish years, the way that the rates of species extinction have changed among different species, just of vertebrates. This isn't including all of life. Uh, again, focusing within vertebrates, it's estimated that at current rates, about 75% of species will be lost over the next 240 to 540 years. I accidentally had a typo because I'm thinking in millions of years, but that is years, centuries. And there was a recent, more recent study indicating that 18% of vertebrates, which is one in roughly six, may be lost by the end of this century alone, and that the rate of species loss is likely accelerating due, due to loss of food web interactions and the ecosystem services that different species provide. And so one, 
we should do everything we can to halt this. And it's not just climate change, it's also habitat fragmentation, it's plastics pollution, the fossil fuel industry, because we are reducing our use of fossil fuels, is actively shifting uh, production of virgin plastics to be able to keep their profits up. So we really need to be vigilant about this. Okay, so I'm gonna make a pitch for some of the things that we can do with high quality genomes as developmental biologists with the knowledge of how systems are developing, the cell and tissue level biology. And so what we've been doing is both trait associated differential gene expression, which I'll go into a little bit more in a moment, is what are the differential gene expression profiles that associate with a particular evolved trait? What are the nearby putative cis-regulatory sequences that have differential accessibility in the tissues that are behaving differently in a species that's evolving versus the reference species? And then looking at the intersection with where we see substantial lineage-specific sequence evolution. And so um, in the hypothesis-driven space, uh, there's, there's been a fair bit of look, for example, at conserved non-coding sequences, at sequence divergence, and then looking at intersections with what those are doing in different tissues. And we're trying to take the entire elephant in three different spheres and intersect it together. Okay, so uh, what gene expression differences do correspond with growth rate differences between species? This was largely the work of Adi Saxena, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab and is now a research scientist at Spark Therapeutics. And what we wanted to do is a direct comparison of gene expression in the distal growth cartilage of a mouse foot compared to a Jerboa foot and ask what genes are differentially expressed in these two tissues. Now to do so, because we're wanting to do read count comparisons between species, we need a really good set of orthologous genes. We need to know that we're comparing apples to apples. And so we worked with Virag Sharma and Michael Hiller to generate a, an exact matching orthologous set of just over 17,000 transcripts that we know are represented in both mouse and jerboa. And when we run this through read mapping and DE-seq2, what we see is that in the direct comparison, about 59% of all genes are differentially expressed, which is a ton. And not necessarily surprising because I've told you these two species have been diverging from their last common ancestor for about 15 million years. And that's a lot of time for a p-value significance 0.05 to emerge. But we're fortunate because we have reason to believe that the uh, sort of general toolkit of cartilage elongation is acting all throughout the body. And as I told you earlier in, th in the introduction, the forelimbs of the two species are very, very similar to one another. And so we reasoned that we could use this direct comparison between the forelimbs of the two species to intersect the data and remove things that are equivalently differentially expressed in both locations because those genes wouldn't explain this vast disproportionate elongation of the Jerboa foot. So that's what I'm showing you here. This is the log twofold change in the forearm versus the feet of the two species, Jerboa versus mouse. And you see this beautiful regression. If genes are differentially expressed in both locations, the correlation has an R squared value of 0.9, no, sorry, a slope of 0.977. So it's a very strong correlation. So if we remove these genes that are equivalently differentially expressed, the genes that are different in both locations, there's about 241 that are not correlating uh, in the two tissues. And then there's another entire set of about 1,500 genes that are differentially expressed only in the feet of the two species. Some of those are not expressed in the forearm, so they can't be differentially expressed, but others are, and they've retained an equivalent expression in the two species in the forearms despite divergence in the hind limbs. But I'm not gonna tell you right now what they are because I'm gonna argue that we really wanna intersect multiple pieces of information. Um, but the punchline of this is that about 10% of genes have expression differences that are associated with the exaggerated Jerboa foot elongation. That's about 1,700 candidates. But there's an issue of network propagation, right? Because what we're looking at here is a snapshot of the transcriptome during an accelerated rate of growth in the foot of the Jerboa. But this is gonna be the primary changes plus everything in the ball of spaghetti that it's touching. 
And what we really want is what are the causative sequence differences that propagate through that network. And so for this, we've been taking a cis-regulatory uh, genomics approach using a TAC-seq in the Jerboa because it's antibody agnostic. It works really well. Um, and so many of you are familiar with a TAC-seq and the read mapping. So we have peaks that are located at genomic regions that are accessible in that particular tissue and that species at that time. And so um, in the transcriptome analysis, we wanted to compare between species because we could, because you can identify orthologous genes because of their conservation across evolutionary time. This is much harder with non-coding sequences, and so the analysis that we've done here is limited to within species with intersections in the data later between the species. And so this is an interesting observation that I'm scratching my head about. It's in the sausage making. I'm not yet sure um, what to make of it, but I wanted to, to illustrate that if you look at the, this is the log twofold change uh, accessibility, so differential accessibility in foot versus arm of each species. In the mouse here, you see that the distribution of peaks uh, follows the sort of bimodal. So you have some that are more accessible in radius and ulna, and you have some that are more accessible in the forearm, or in the foot, sorry. Um, whereas in the Jerboa, there's a, a much higher prevalence of peaks that are commonly accessible in both cartilages, which I think is really interesting because if you look at the morphology of these bones, they're much more similar to each other in that they are longer proximal acting bones. And we have other pieces of evidence that the distal limb could be actually proximalized in the Jerboa. So we're really interested in following up on this. But then again, this peak accessibility is also prone to a network propagation problem because anything that's differentially expressed that's binding to a genomic site can affect the differential accessibility of a site. It doesn't necessarily have to be the underlying sequence divergence. And so we have two approaches to get at trying to understand or try to identify where in the genome there is substantial sequence divergence that may be causative of the differential accessibility and the differential expression changes that we see propagating through the network. What this is showing you is where genomes are really valuable. And so this is a phylofit tree based on a neutral substitution model. These are fourfold um, degenerate sites, uh, wobble positions and coding sequences. And it gives you an idea of this sort of neutral substitution model of how these species are related to one another and their relative rates of, of evolution. And so uh, what you're looking at up here are all murioid rodents, mouse, rat, vole, deer, mice, or, you know, people are interested in deer, mice. There are a lot of deer, mice genomes that have been sequenced. And, um, and then we have sitting right here next to the murioid rodents are the gerboas. Uh, and then these are the non-myomorpha outgroup rodent species that had the highest quality genomes. And so these genomes are really, really useful because now we can start to model evolutionary rates on these trees for each of the ataxic peaks that we've identified in mouse and in gerboa. So we're taking two approaches to this. One is truly in progress right now. This is using a Bayesian detection um, model for identifying the rate of changes on a phylogenetic tree. It's Philo ACC that was developed um, by a group of people, including Tim Sackton, who we're collaborating with. And uh, what it does is it applies a Bayesian approach to each of the sequences and how they're evolving throughout the tree so that you can try to test the statistical significance of any given peak falling within a certain model. And so the model we would be interested in is, so you see in this example tree, there are multiple target species. You want to see an accelerated test a model, find se sequences that fit a model where there may be accelerated evolution within your target species and neutral drift or even constraint within the other species of your tree. And so this is a really robust way of detecting these sequences that show lineage-specific statistical evidence of acceleration. Uh, to run 80,000 peaks is going to take about 10 days on 16 cores of compute time, though, so we're making sure we get it right before we run it. <laughs> Um, okay, so then the other approach that we're going to take to each of these peaks after the Bayesian phylogenetic analysis, which is actually what we've already done, 
uh, is to detect acceleration on a branch using an approach that was published recently in Cell for the HAKERS, or Human Accelerated Unique Regions, is, is the first application of this. And so what you do is you have the species tree. I showed you the species tree before. And then you have a peak tree akin to a gene tree. Um, so this would be one of our 80,000 ATAC peaks and how its evolution um, rates of evolution appear on the tree. And then there's an equation for velocity. So you're evaluating the velocity of sequence divergence on a given branch. So we're taking this branch that leads to the two species of jerboas that have genomic sequence. So this is branch one. And it is branch one over the uh, neutral substitution model for the entire tree, OK? Times the size of the element that you're looking at. And that gives you the velocity of substitution along that branch. So if it is similar to the species tree, this should basically be one. And then you calculate the velocity of the branch immediately prior to that. So this is the branch leading up to the node before the branch leading to the two jerboas. You take the substitution rate on that branch over the age of that branch according to the neutral substitution model. And that gives you the velocity along this branch of your gene tree. And then acceleration is V minus V naught. So your acceleration minus your prior, or sorry, your velocity minus your prior velocity gives you your acceleration. And so that tells you how rapidly this branch is evolving relative to the branch prior, OK? Hopefully that's reasonably clear. OK, so preliminary data from this, this is again just zooming in now on the part of the tree that includes the jumping mouse. This is a facultative bipedal species native to North America um, that is within the dipodoid rodents. It's not as extreme in its morphology as the two species of jerboas that we have genomes for. Um, and if you look at all jerboa cartilage peaks on this jerboa tree, taking this acceleration model that I just explained, what you see is this quadrant down here, my laser pointer suddenly decided to die, this quadrant down here in the corner, here, is showing you all of the peaks that have accelerated prior to jerboa speciation and then slowed down after speciation, suggesting those sequences have been constrained or at least stopped accelerating at the same rate. What I think is really interesting, one, I think this is really interesting, because we have a lot of peaks that have accelerated right before these two species of jerboa speciated with the same morphology. The other thing I think is really interesting is that if we look at the peaks that we identify in mouse cartilage and look at how those orthologous sequences are evolving within this branch of the jerboas, we don't see the uh, divergence, the sequence divergence that we see within the jerboa sequences on the jerboa tree. So what that says is that this isn't just something weird happening in this corner of the jerboa that it's evolving at a much faster rate because another set of sequences in the jerboa genome that are derived from these mouse peaks are not evolving with the same dynamics. And so there's something unique to these jerboa peaks. And there's also a fair number of them that we need to intersect with other data. And so that's what we're doing now uh, because we are moving very quickly towards functional tests of some of these loci, but um, with the intention of choosing very carefully, letting the, uh, the evolutionary signatures tell us which sequences to model in a mouse as opposed to having this sort of a priori thought that we understand what evolution should be doing and therefore select the genes that we want to study. And this comes back to biodiversity. There is thus far untapped biodiversity, and I would argue opportunity throughout the tree of life to be able to get information about how species have evolved with improved sensitivity. So we have two jerboa species and all of these other rodents. Now imagine how much better our phylo ACC analysis would be, for example, if we had more species of jerboas that are similar to one another, 
but then also different enough from one another to be able to tease apart some of the nuances of which loci might be contributing to which aspects of the phenotype. The other thing um, is that with more species coverage, we get greater phenotypic diversity, which I just um, spoke about. There are actually 52 close relatives of, ger uh, well, 52 species of gerboas and their closest relatives, 33 gerboas. And other species, including um, species in the genus Cecista, which is the birch mouse, that's this guy over here in the corner, that is a very mousy, mouse-looking mouse thing. And so, <laughs> so we use Mus musculus, the laboratory mouse, as our model because we have them. But it would be wonderful to actually use the species that splits that evolutionary divergence in half and would give us more information about what is truly a quadrupedal feature and what's a bipedal feature. And then um, there are emerging approaches that I'm super excited about to be able to uh, generate phylogenetic aware transcriptome and regulatory genome analyses so that instead of doing just uh, this sample to this sample transcriptional analysis, you can actually do that across a phylogenetic tree and try to identify which signatures within your transcriptome are uh, evidence of that part of the phylogeny and maybe worth more attention. Uh, so I got to go to Mongolia and collect more gerboas. And I'm not kidding. I'm going to go to Mongolia. Um, last, thank you to all of the members of my lab. Uh, Adi started this project some years ago, and Alex, as soon as the newest high coverage, complete, beautiful genome was released, took over the computational analysis that I've talked about. Um, all of our collaborators, in particular for the ATAXIC, we've worked with Terry Capolini in his lab. For the Philo ACC, Alex has gotten a ton of help from Tim Sackton. And for a lot of our orthology work, um, it's Virag and Michael Hiller, and then all of my funding sources. And thank you again for having me and being here and engaging in all of these wonderful conversations. Fantastic. Thank you, Kim. I love the uh, hot off the press, this is not finished story talk. <laughs> They're the most interesting and exciting. Good. Thank yeah. you. Um, while we prepare for our panel discussion, any questions for Kim? <laughs> Not all at once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. James. Thanks, thanks. That's, that was really interesting. So, um, how, so this, this change in morphology will go hand in hand with changes in behavior, ecological niche, you know, even um, the you know, infections and parasites that the the animal is exposed to. So how do you, how do you sort of deconvolute that when you're looking at the genome? So what is, how do you identify what is driving the morphological change versus the other changes which will go hand in hand with that morphological change? That, that is a great question. I think frequently when people do this kind of analysis, they don't have the sort of wet lab biological specimens to be able to intersect with their data. And so Often what you see, just because of limitations of availability of resources, is a whole genome analysis and then a gene ontology enrichment to look for loci that are evolving, that fall within the categories that you are interested in. I think that because we've done the RNA-seq and ATAC-seq, we're looking at biologically relevant sites in the genome. We're feeding those into our uh, phylogenetic analysis. and so. It, that doesn't necessarily ensure that what we get back out is relevant to cartilage elongation, but it increases the probability as opposed to doing a whole genome scan. Okay, one more from Lasky. Thanks, Kim. That was excellent. So I was curious about why you think the intersection approach is so important, right, where you want to look at the overlap between genes that are differentially expressed as well as the, the chromatin regions that are open and undergoing accelerated evolution. Is it that mostly you want to find a few genes to actually study in, on, in, at the bench? Because, you know, the data you showed from the ataxic accelerated regions were the control of peaks from mice that don't show acceleration in gerboa was really powerful. It, you know, 
Right. I would interpret that to mean that all of the other ones you did find to be accelerated are real and really important for the biology. Absolutely. So I'm curious about how you, why do you think the intersection is important? It's for the reason that you've given, uh, to filter down to the highest priority sequences to maybe start to build models. And so my goal is to first describe everything we find in each of the sets of data and then to build those intersections. And Alex and I have spent a lot of time, too, talking about not necessarily just does it have the highest score in all three categories, but building out a quantitative, uh, mul like multivectoral model that will allow us to, you know, maybe take the strongest thing in this category that's a little moderate in this category so that we can really look at the data in a multivariate sphere. Do we have Great. time for any more? Or, okay. Um, Catch me later. That we hold these while we get set up for our panel discussion. And so can I invite uh, Aha back up? I'll just take this down. Yeah. Can you mute me again also? We've got four fantastic panelists uh, coming up to join us here, Ahab Abuhef and Kim Cooper, who you just heard from, and two other exciting people, one of whom is known to you from yesterday afternoon's session, Iñaki Ristrillo, who's coming up at the side here, and also uh, Michael Reichsig, who has not yet spoken, but who will be speaking tomorrow afternoon. And um, uh, Michael is a developmental biologist working in Bern in Switzerland, uh, whose focus at the moment is on uh, stomata in grass leaves. So the grass are breathing when you walk on them, and you are crushing their stomata, and Michael knows all about that, so <laughs> feel guilty. All right, and so we want to make this panel discussion as responsive as possible to the needs and interests, of course, of all of you, uh, the scientists who are involved here. And so to that end, what I thought I would do would be to uh, let our speakers uh, hold on for a minute, catch their breath, have a drink of water. I'll give a couple of uh, introductory ideas and a couple of introductory questions to throw out at them. And then we'd like to throw it to you, the audience, including our online audience. So again, if you're on, on, online and watching us and you have questions for the panel, one or all panelists, then please put them into the chat and Catherine Brown will shout them out. I'll be watching out for her so that you can also be represented here in the discussion. And so panelists, you've got uh, two microphones, so share them nicely. Uh, among you, and uh, don't feel compelled to answer every question uh, or to speak on uh, every single question or in the same order. I'll let you self-organize uh, unless you tell me otherwise. All right, so I think for both Kim and Ahab, they gave us a very nice context that put their Evo Devo, Evo Devo Eco work into a very explicit context of climate change and biodiversity loss. And at the same time, of course, many of you who are developmental biologists or may think of yourselves as sort of hardcore developmental biologists may not always be thinking in that framework. And, uh, and so it's interesting to consider the extent to which our drive, which I think we all share here, to using emerging, non-traditional, less well-traveled, whatever you want to call them, low PR uh, model organisms in our work, to what extent are those choices that we have all made here, were they driven by interests in biodiversity loss, by climate change, or were they driven by other reasons? And so I'm curious to know from our panelists here to what extent your choices of model organisms recently or in the distant past when you were all young, grr, um, might have been driven by an interest either at that time or in the future of using your studies to further our understanding of climate change and biodiversity loss. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, 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 right. I can't stand silence. It's true. Is this my, does my microphone work? No, this one. Yeah, speak into it. Put okay, it in front okay. of your mouth. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's very interesting. I think um, these problems, I, you know, when I started the ANSA in 1995, the climate change, biodiversity loss wasn't really a priority. It wasn't a thing so much. And uh, it was more... I mean, at that time, Evo Devo was grappling with uh, homology, the concept of homology. And, you know, at that time, there were very few genomes. P 
people were, you know, finding similar genes in a mouse, in a fly, in a, in, in a worm, and we were just trying to say, well, does that mean that if, like, uh, this gene is, you know, expressed in the brain of a worm and a fly, does that mean they're homologous or not? I mean, we, you know, so I was just trying to run away from all of that, actually. That's why I chose the ants, mm. because they had dramatic phenotypes within a colony, and I just didn't even have to think about homology, and that's where it started. And then... Yeah, the rest is history. I mean, I don't know, you know, then next thing you know, the eco's running in, the whatever's running in, it just kind of develops slowly, but that's me. Um, I grew up out in the country in Texas and collected all kinds of weird things, and my mom learned quickly not to open anything with holes poked in the lid. <laughs> and I also grew up in a, a religious household and was a creationist. And when I was in college and started doing research and started doing zoo blots with, you know, DNA from a whole bunch of different species and sort of seeing none of this would even be possible if evolution weren't true, I think that really kind of started the trigger. And then I was a grad student starting in 99, kind of around the same time when Ahab is talking about this kind of awareness that so many of the genes are homologous and how are these genes doing this thing in a fly and that thing in a human, but it's the same gene. And um, I, I think that that like, bug and snake collector in my childhood came back. And, and maybe even a little bit of like this feeling that the real marvel of species generation uh, had kind of been kept from me. And so I think that was maybe part of the pull toward deciding that this is something that I actually wanted to know more about mm. by creating that knowledge. All right, so I mean, I guess I'm working on a, on a very important topic uh, related to climate change and uh, plant fitness and, and plant physiology. but. I mean, to be very honest, after my uh, PhD, I was just looking for a system that allows me to do really good developmental biology. And uh, a, a group leader in, in my PhD lab once told me if you can actually find a developmental system that also has a really clear physiological readout, that's the bingo. And so I started to, uh, to read about stomatal biology and the beautiful stomatal developmental studies that came out from Dominique's and, and, and Keiko Torres labs and, and Fred Sachs lab at the time when I was uh, still a PhD student and is super fascinating, very accessible on the surface of leaves, um, uh, morphological diversity between species. And so um, um, for me, moving away uh, from Arabidopsis into, uh, in, into grasses was mostly driven by the fact that they have very spectacular stomata, right? And so really doing this evo devo approach of how different uh, shapes and morphologies and cellular compositions come about. And then by being uh, uh, close to Joe Berry, which is a, is a very big stomatal ecophysiologist, he actually um, uh, gave me the idea, you should do some gas exchange measurements, right? And so we started to really link uh, form and function. And so I think, but in the end, I stumbled a little bit into this, what I would call evo devo physio um, uh, field that I'm finding myself in at the moment. So, I mean, it was not really, it was purely phenomenon, curiosity driven. But. Mm. Yeah, I, I, well, similar. I, I think we were driven by the question of the origin of animals, the modern organisms that we work, and never by, you know, climate change or the loss of biodiversity. Of course, you know, as we were mentioning, we are interested in biodiversity, yeah, we are very interested, and I think it's part of, you know, more or less the goal to understand things. At the end, you want to understand biodiversity and how it evolved, but the models were chosen by completely different things. Thank you. I've got uh, one more question that came to me as I was listening to uh, Michael talking about looking for a system that you could do really great developmental biology with, and I think many of us were uh, brought into science with that sort of approach. And I often have conversations with colleagues, particularly earlier stage career colleagues at graduate level or postdoctoral level, maybe being curious about moving outside of their current system or into an organism that is less well studied or even into conceptual and technical approaches that are not within the traditional wheelhouse of developmental biology, like doing field work or doing phylogenetically contextualized sequence analysis. Um, 
and not being sure, finding it very daunting and wondering how do I start incorporating knowledge from these other fields that are very deep and technically challenging, but I am, you know, so quote unquote, just a developmental biologist. And so I'd be curious to learn from uh, those panelists here. Some of you started sort of deep inside developmental biology. Some of you started deep inside evolutionary biology and came to development. But what has been your approach to incorporating different intellectual streams and different technical approaches into your research programs because all of you have done that in different ways and it'd be interesting to hear how you've gone about that and any advice you might even have for junior colleagues wanting to move in that direction. Be a good playmate and find people who are better at you, better than you at the things you want to do and be open to learning, and put one foot in front of another doing the work until you can't. And I think that's really, like, I don't, I don't worry about not being able to do a thing. Like, I try to find someone who can help me to do the thing as a playmate. Uh, and by play, I'm serious about playmate, too, because when I'm looking for collaborators, I'm looking for someone who's got that same spirit, you know, just like, let's figure this out. And I think... Uh, if you find good colleagues who are patient and willing to teach you and you put the work in to learn, then you've learned everything you've learned up till now, so why not learn more? I mean, I think I can only second this, right? So for me, it was really people um, that helped me do what I'm doing now. And I mean, one of the things, so I'm definitely weakest in the evolutionary part, and so I also try to avoid talking about evolution too much. I call it comparative development and, and things like this. So I, I feel it's just not pretending that you know everything, right? Um, I'm asking for help and, I mean, it, it needs luck, but also research your future mentors, right? So I think this is really important. So I, I mean, I didn't hear an, a single negative thing about Dominique Bergman when I when I interviewed in, in her postdoc lab, right? And so things like this really matter, being in a, in a good environment um, with uh, a supportive mentor, um, uh, supportive colleagues, and, and, and a stimuli, uh, stimulating scientific community where you're choosing uh, to go, uh, your next step, basically. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm afraid I, I don't have many tips on this. Uh, I didn't prepare anything in my case. I think, I mean, it just came. Many things just came, you know, because life is like that. So sometimes I was not thinking in that direction and somebody convinced me, you know. Um, and I, we, we went into that direction. Or, or then it came, you know, it came naturally because it, at some point you cannot answer the things with what you were doing before. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just impossible, you know. You cannot, you, 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 there is a moment in which you cannot go further. And the only, mo the only way to go farther is that you have other directions. And then it's naturally. I mean, it's not that you think, it's that you are at the end of the fence, so you cannot do anything else. And then the only way to jump that fence is that something else come, either a partner or a colleague or something, or you just go into another direction. So I think it's, it just came naturally. Um, so you don't, you don't need to resist that. So if it comes, you go. And I don't have any other team. <laughs> I think, um, I think one of the biggest challenges to non-model organisms is, I mean, it's integrative by nature. And you have to be comfortable with um, being a jack of all trades, but the master of none. And unfortunately, our system kind of selects against it. I mean, there's a lot of talk. People like the, oh yes, integrative biology. Oh yeah, integrative, even journals, you know. Uh, yes, this is integrative, but the reviewers come back and say, They'll hold you to the standards of each subfield that you're trying to integrate. And then it's very discouraging, you know, so then, and it's hard because, you know, um, you know, getting nice pictures or nice images in a non-model system, I mean, now it's getting easier with HCR and other techniques, but for many of us, for many years, I mean, I could just spend six months for just a simple in situ and I can't get it to work and it's just... I mean, they're looking good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so, so it's really, uh, you know, so there's a, something in the system that, I mean, I think has to change. And um, so, that, you know, that's, that's part of it. And, and you also have to be comfortable floating for a bit because, I mean, I, I did, I mean, before I figured 
I mean, literally, when I was saying that, you know, the network, I was focused on the network. I was focused on the network for years and years and years, um, looking for, you know, just trying to figure out, well, if I can just find the gene that is going to make the difference between a wing queen and a wingless worker. And I didn't look at levels up, you know, so it's when I found, that, you know, the disc had a function, but that took maybe 10 years. And for 10 years, I was just kind of like going along, not really knowing what I was doing. And so you just have to kind of be comfortable that at some point it's going to make sense. Uh, or I was very lucky, one of the two. But you just have to kind of wait, be, be very patient. You have to have a kind of personality. But uh, anyway, I think uh, just to, I think uh, we have to, I think grassroots, you know. I am an editor-in-chief. James is an editor-in-chief. You have to go to James and say, James, you development has to, you know, accept more integrative biology and don't let reviewers hold you. Just, you know, it has to be like you have to kind of let some things go and let, you know, it's kind of hard to find the, the sweet spot. But yeah, we have to we have to advocate. We can't just be silent for integrative biology. I want to echo that. I think that was a really powerful <laughs> statement about uh, being reviewed by people who don't do non-traditional systems. And uh, my possibly, I would argue, yeah, least favorite beginning of any comment is why don't you just, right? I've said this to a few people here already. Why don't you just, why don't you just do this? Why don't you just do that? And so, you know, being in a mouse adjacent system, uh, being in a medically relevant you know, system, skeletal biology. Next month, I'm going to the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research meeting. Shout out to anyone out there who's going to be at ASBMR who might be watching this. But it's a very different community because they're all clinicians, right? And so communicating what we do and how we do it and, and why it's different is, can be really challenging. But it's really rewarding, especially when you're the most different speaker at the meeting and it's like a coffee break in the middle of the session. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I mean, just to say, I think, uh, you know, thanks to all the organizers of this meeting, I think this is a landmark meeting because it's coming from the developmental biology community and to, uh, to express an interest in non-conventional models from mechanistically minded biologists already is like a huge step forward. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think those are really important points. Um, and as um, one of the academic editors of development, and of course, as a member of the community, I want to just remind us that, you know, we are the reviewers, right? The reviewers are not, you know, when we're reviewing a paper, we are a helpful colleague providing constructive input into the field. But when we're an author, the reviewers are these hateful aliens who hate us <laughs> and want to get us fired, right? But it's us, right? And so, we need to sort of try to keep that in mind. And I think for integrative biology, what we have are a series of different data types flowing into the field. And uh, that means that as reviewers, our job can be harder. We need to educate ourselves more sometimes to the standards of data production and presentation and analysis in different fields so that we can assess what this is just my professional opinion, what I think we need to be assessing in reviewing for development or for any journal, which is do the claims of the authors, are they well supported by the data that are provided? And are the data that are provided, are they rigorously uh, applied? And do the conclusions or insights uh, match the vision or the mission of the journal in this case? But we're seeing now in development, certainly as an editor, I can tell you a much broader array of data types and approaches coming in. And yet as reviewers, I would ask us all to remember that we're not trying to apply the standards of one field to another necessarily, but asking what are the insights that this paper offers? If it's to offer this insight, do the claims, are the claims well supported by the data that are provided? And sometimes we need to educate ourselves about the nature of these data or ask the authors for maybe sometimes further clarification as to the nature of the data and the rigor of the data there. All right. I, of course, could you know think of a thousand things to ask, but we need to be driven by the interests of more people here. And so let's have some questions from you all, including those of you online. We have many, many, many. And so please, we'll uh, pass the microphone yeah, to Gautam. And uh, yeah, then we'll go from there. Catherine, you want to go on online first, or? Um, oh, do we have an online? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Um, super interesting already. So, as to the panelists, as you found yourself 
in the more eco space or climate change, dealing with climate change either by chance or by design, do you feel now external pressure to, to, to cleave to more simplified narratives? So a clean story, climate change is driving this extinction or you know, Ahab's paradox. Like, do you find difficulty then in communicating that? And do you find an accompanying need for or the responsibility towards a greater engagement with science communication with the public than you would otherwise have felt you had to engage with? So I'm just curious if that's something that's come up for all of you in, in your work. Uh, good, great question. I mean, I think, um, again, I, you know, there's an industry out there. I mean, obviously, climate change is picked up, and there's a lot of people working, a lot of ecologists working on climate change. Largely, it's because that's how they get their funding, um, you know, and, and, and try it, and, you know, trying. And I, I think, you know, if I said what I said today, it would probably fall very flat on the ears of ecologists, to be honest. I mean, again, you're talking, you know, to different communities, and they don't really, I mean, to them, again, the phenotype, first of all, they don't think of the phenotype that much. They're starting to think about developmental plasticity and the phenotype, those are very small minority, but largely it's, uh, you know, genomics, genetic variation, you know, genetic potential, and so for them to think about, like, you know, complexity and phenotypic innovation, I think it's too far out there. So, you know, again, it would take a lot of communication, a lot of, you know, just saying, well, you guys, you know, the phenotype is important. And I don't think you can get a real predictive theory of how organisms are going to respond to climate change unless you take into account the, the phenotype. And, um, but yeah, I think it's, but it, largely because they're not trained to think about these things. I mean, it's, there's a challenge. So. If I can add something to that. So I don't think for me it's like a pressure to change my communication or change how I talk about my science, but it's a bit like how much is my focus of my research justified in the current crisis, right? So is it justified to do basically what we're doing, you know, for the beauty of cell division and cell specification and morphogenesis? Or should we actually move more towards apply questions. So I think this is this is a, a bit of the struggle uh, I'm feeling at the moment. And I think this is not just me, right? This is, we just had a research evaluation and in the ecology department it was the same thing, right? How much should we keep doing innovative, cool science and how much should we actually focus on conservation biology, which is a super pressing matter. And the same is true for agriculture relevant trades, for medical, I mean, name it, right? So, but I think this is actually sometimes a bit of the struggle. I mean, not so much about the communication, but whether, whether I should invest more in, in, in climate change relevant trade research. Yeah, I, I, I think I've got to come in with another question. Is that right? Yes, please, sorry. <laughs> you can maybe come back to that topic later. Um, so my question is following on from this, and we we kind of know what makes a good developmental biology model, and we kind of know what makes a good evolutionary biology model, but what makes a good climate change model? And, and how, who knows that answer? Maybe it's conservation scientists, but I'm curious what you guys think of that. Well, I'll say one thing. I think, uh, no, I think one necessary aspect, we have to be looking at a population level. So that's the, probably the biggest challenge, right? So we don't tend to think population level. So evolutionary biologists are always thinking population level. Uh, well, not always, but yeah. But for a large degree, this kind of necessary thing. Um, developmental biologists are not, and they're not thinking mechanism. So there has to be some, I think, mix of mechanism and population biology. But that's the biggest challenge, I think. Uh, I, I would like to mention that um, it depends also what you want to accomplish. So do you want to analyze loss, habitat loss? Maybe we don't need a model organism for that, or we cannot find it. Do we want to understand biodiversity loss? Again, I, I'm not completely sure that we need that. Actually, I have to say that the whole panel, the question of the panel was, why do we need unconventional models in the light of climate change, which is already it's implicit that we need them. I think the question should have been, do we need 
and conventional models in the light of climate change. Uh, and then it will depend. It depends on what we are looking for. Are we looking for, you know, to save the planet? Are we looking to save ourselves? Are we looking to save diversity? And then, depending on the question, you will need some model organisms or others. And maybe you don't have model organisms. Um, I mean, and I, I, you know, I'm totally in favor to analyze and understand biodiversity, but um, this is a question that we need to, to figure out. Uh, I don't think it's clear, at least not on my mind. Yeah. So, I mean, I might be very biased here, right? But I, I think actually when we're thinking about biodiversity loss and I mean, the, the three big or the big challenges of climate change, of course, catastrophic events like floodings and stuff, but from a biological perspective is biodiversity loss in agriculture in the end. And so I think always, so then I would really argue for photosynthetic organisms because they're basically the primary structural components, the primary nutritional components of any ecosystem, right? So we heard of brown algae, if anybody ever dived in the kelp forests in California, you know how diverse these environments are. We heard about the coral reefs in the end. What makes coral reefs that productive and that important is their photosynthetic symbionts. And we're talking grasslands and forests and the Amazon and so on. So I feel like suffering a bit, and this is again biased, very personal perspective, right? But from plant blindness of society, I would call it photosynthetic organism blindness of society. <laughs> Um, and of the field of biology, of biology itself as well, due to medical um, 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 concerns and medical focuses, I would argue it's, it's photosynthetic organisms we should focus on. But I'm going to echo that because uh, we have a good core of plant biologists at UC San Diego, and I hadn't worked alongside plant biologists before taking this position, and. I had not appreciated how limited the funding is for plant biology, and you're absolutely right. If we're gonna engineer our way out of this situation, it's gonna be in the, in the photosynthetic organisms that are capturing that carbon and, and trying to reverse the effects of climate change. And so we can all do our part then to lobby funding agencies to shift more attention to these photosynthetic organisms, because we all have that voice. We have a question from the Matrix. Yeah, so uh, this comes from Jamie Gagnon, and he's asking, sort of coming back to that, that question of, of collaboration, but in a world where when many of us live in split biology departments, how can we foster conversations and collaborations with our ecology and climate change colleagues? Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I'm talking too much, but I mean, this is a really tricky one. So I think in the end, if we're, if we're thinking climate change, it's a multi-angle, multi-perspective problem. And so one of the reasons we moved to University of Bern, we have the Oscar Center for Climate Change Research there, and it basically includes from psychologists over economists into climate physicists, ecologists, and, and, and plant scientists in this case. It includes the whole spectrum. So when I think, you know, crises like these might allow us actually talking together. You also saw this during the, the COVID pandemic, right? Suddenly molecular biologists could talk to the general public about mRNA. And so I feel crises are always opportunities, but I think it needs centers like this where there is subsist substantial funding in there, there's platforms, and there is um, um, excitement to learn from each other and to talk to each other in a very supportive way. Like, and in this kind of Socratian spirit that we know that we don't know nothing, right? And I feel like this is the only way forward uh, for any crisis. And I mean, this is one of the major, so yeah, I don't have much more. Yeah. No, I would echo that too. I mean, I think uh, at McGill, we have something called the Quebec Center for Biodiversity Science. And you get the perspective that exactly, you, you, there's no way that you can solve this alone. You need social scientists, you need, you know, philosophers, you need, like, you know, the whole, you know, molecular biologists, ecologists, the whole, the whole show. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. But, you know, unfortunately, there is a lot, still remains tension between mechanistic biology and, and, and evolutionary biology and ecology that uh, exists still out there. Uh, and that's a big problem still for, for us. I'm smirking at the word mechanism again. I have this theory 
that mechanism is whatever the biological level of organization is smaller than what you're currently working on. <laughs> so for ecologists, it's organismal biology. For organismal biologists, it's tissue and cell biology. For cell biology, it's the molecular, right? So yeah, it's all of these levels need to be integrated to be able to answer challenging questions. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, I mean, it was pretty clear that no one uh, picked you, no one of you picked the model system um, or your question because of the biodiversity loss or climate change, which is yeah, understandable, but I'm wondering now since times are changing, do you start integrating this more into your research? Do you feel some kind of responsibility? And if so, yeah, how do you express that? I mean, it could also be in some sort of like within your teaching program or within like communication that you take uh, a part in or so. I mean, do you, yeah, do you start integrating these topics and see yourself sort of as having a lead role to address these, um, yeah, overall uh, important topics and questions? Um, for me, it's teaching, for sure, and that wasn't picking on Ahab saying mechanism. That was my deep frustration with that word in general. <laughs> um, but I, I spend a good... So I teach the introductory ev evolution and ecology course. So it's um, first-year biology majors and non-majors, 300 students at a time. And, uh, you know... They already know that climate change is happening, and so you know I touch on it. But then I go more into plastics pollution because, or I go into um, the reality of single stream recycling, and that most of us are wish cycling when you put a plastic bag into your home recycling because it's gonna gum up the machinery. And so I feel like when when we have the opportunity to teach these classes because of the research that we do and the recognized expertise. We have that captive audience then to be able to try to educate on some of these other levels to have maybe a bigger impact than where my research sits. And then I also figure if undergrads decide they want to come work with me because they think the Jerboa is cool, who knows what they'll go on and then decide to do in their own research. And so, you know, in part by just inspiring that curiosity and the drive to learn, if if environmental science is where their passion is, then hopefully I can seed that movement forward. Um, oh, sorry. Do, do you want to go ahead? Okay. So, yeah, I love this discussion we're having, and thank you for your honest uh, points of view. As a young researcher who just finished her PhD and is trying to find out what to do next, um, I am a molecular biologist and developmental biologist by formation. But then I, of course, see the status of the world. And, you know, a research, um, as you are in a very honest way displaying, it's not guided by climate change. It's with all the questions we address, it's curiosity-based. We want to understand how life evolved. Um, yeah, the genetics un underlying this. Is, these are very valid questions. I love it. You know, it's what I've been doing all this time. But then, given the status of the world, I can't help but ask myself, can we afford curiosity-driven research? And also, our research consumes and has a very big impact, in a way, on, on resources, uh, right? Plastic uh, pollution, it's big on research. So, yeah, this is a question I'm posing to you as this panel. Like, can, can we afford curiosity-driven research in the context we are living nowadays? And if so, for how long? Yeah. Should I? Yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, he mentioned a little bit, you know, this, this feeling. I think it's, so one thing it's um, on science. Uh, I think we, and coming back to the question that Gautam said before, I don't think we have, you know, the pressure to go into that direction, like with the system of science. But I do feel the pressure from people that are not on science. Um, and I feel it quite a lot. And lately more, I think they are waiting that we do something and we are not doing that. And then, of course, we think, I, I mean, the same thing that you were saying, you know, we spend, I mean, a lot of money, and actually my time as well, you know, the time of many people, you know, that we are dedicating to questions that maybe are not the questions that we should be dedicating our, our efforts, our times, our money, our funding, and it's public funding, you know. So, um, personally, I think at some point, we should, we should consider that. And also, we are an example to people, 
And, you know, we all accept that, but outside, outside science, you know, that you go and travel to beautiful place to look for organisms, and they don't look the same way as we look at it. Eh? You know, it's, oh, okay, so there is climate change, we should be careful, and then you travel 1,000 kilometers to go to the Arctic because it's super nice and you will see a wonderful whale or something. They don't see it the same way. And at some point, if, if we don't want to go outside of society, we should, we should do the opposite. I mean, we should do, we should give a sample of that. Uh, and I think um, that's more or less what you were meaning, I guess. And, and I think both, I mean, I'm not talk, I'm talking, I guess, but most of us, I, I think we are thinking that and it's normal that you are starting and you think that, so, yeah. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. There are many questions that remain, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very difficult question. I guess from my particular viewpoint, I think basic fundamental science is absolutely important, and I think it's very important uh, in building just a scientific culture in society. That's probably the most important thing because that will bring an appreciation for science and what it brings. And I, and I don't think, uh, you know, as a scientist, it has to be mutually exclusive. I mean, we could use the ants. I mean, we kind of started wanting to bring in, you know, uh, ecology into the equation, and somehow it, we just kind of fell into it. And so you can, you, I mean, you have a choice, right? You're free as a scientist, so you can have some fundamental questions, some whatever questions. I'll just say, like, I mean, you know, the origins of life, I was just teaching on cyanobacteria. You know, that thing changed the whole atmosphere. That, that the great oxidation event 3.5 billion years ago, small microbe. So who knows if we'll discover a microbe or engineer a microbe that might, like, redress the balance of... Uh, or, go or go too far, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll stop there, yeah. <laughs> so if I can just quickly comment, because I touched upon this before as well. And, I mean, that's definitely a struggle I also feel, right? But then I do think that by being a scientist and by pushing, basically, evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based policy-making, and understanding for science in general, right, I feel you have a big impact, no matter what you study. And then in the end, you don't really know what comes from your fundamental research. I mean, who would have thought that the folks studying bacterial immunity would revolutionize biotechnology? by discovering CRISPR-Cas9, right? So I sometimes feel we don't know what the solution is, so we have to look everywhere. And the important thing is that, in my opinion, that we really lobby for science as a fundamental pillar of our society, mm -hmm. right? And as a fundamental way to make decisions. Um, so there are still people that deny climate change, right? Even though the data is really, really strong. And I feel like by just being a scientist and explaining how we, you know, find this data and how we control for our experiment and how we can model some of these things, I think you're doing a very important job already. Whether you're doing something specific that basically is improving plant traits that will um, uh, fare better in, in higher and uh, in, in hotter and drier environments, or whether you're doing something extremely fundamental but still pushing for these kind of understandings in society. I mean, this is at least how I call myself. Um, I'm down a bit, I guess. I see Emeril in the back row that I don't think anyone else can see. So a term that's hardly come up in this meeting, and Evo Devo people almost don't talk about it at all, is adaptation. And if we're talking about climate change, so I see Kim smiling because you're working at, uh, on an extreme phenotype. So if you work on an extreme phenotype, you have to think about adaptation. But if we're thinking in scales of climate change, so we should either be looking at organisms that are already adapted or pre-adapted to climate change, or as Ahab was telling us, adaptation that can take place over thousands or tens of thousands of years, to adapt to climate change. So, so we have talked about this, and I'm actually interested to hear from the, the other panel members whether you think about adaptation uh, as, or how we can understand adaptation to help us think about how the world will adapt to climate change. So we have, you can also answer, even though it's a good idea. <laughs> end, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. I mean, I think that's where, um, you know, adaptation is a very interesting uh, concept. And, and from the very beginning, you know, Richard Lewinton 
made the comment that, you know, we often think of organisms, uh, you know, the, the environmental niche is just sitting there and organisms slot into those environments. So we're changing the environment and then they have to fit to their environments. Whereas, you know, that's the connotation of adaptation. He never really liked it in the sense that, well, you know, the organisms themselves are changing the environment too. So we're changing it, they're changing it. And there's like the, the whole idea of niche construction. I mean, it kind of is this two-way causation between the organism and the environment. And, you know, that's, I, I think that a lot of biology hasn't quite absorbed that. And, and in the way we design our experiments, you know, even thinking about, uh, you know, whether we think, you know, who's, where's the causation happening and where's it going and, yeah. But I think it's, you know, this is where, you know, the philosophy of biology really helps too, you know, and just trying to think about um, the concept of adaptation in the, in the context of Ivo Divo. And I think Ivo Divo is really making strides. I mean, it's, you know, it's really eco Ivo Divo too is really helping realize that adaptation is a tricky thing. But yeah, but it's important nonetheless. I guess some of it is wondering, there's a, a lot of opportunity to study how species are adapting to climate change, but some of me wonders if that's just trying to predict who's still gonna be around when we're all gone, right? So like, we can look at populations, we can look at how they're adapting, we can say, okay, you know, these are the things that are likely to survive. I can imagine a world post-human. Uh, and I'm, I'm more on board with the <laughs> photosynthetic species now and like trying to reverse a lot of this so that we don't, because this is, you know, I, when I teach my class and I talk about, you know, save the planet, right? Because like this was in the 90s or so. It's like, we have to save the planet. And I, um, I do this thing in one of my lectures where it was, the planet's already survived five mass extinctions. 98% of all life on Earth was gone in the Permian, at the end of the Permian. And, and the planet kept going. So like, the real question is, how do we keep ourselves here? Yeah, I just want to, just to jump on this, like totally go off the deep end and, yeah. and just say like, you know, in the face of AI, I mean, I'm wondering who's going to be doing the adapting in the next, you know, five to 10 years. <laughs> you know, that's just a whole other conversation. And by the way, I mean, we're the ones who are training all these algorithms. And, and you know, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and, you know, there's a guy named Mo Gaudet. He's like, he was one of the founders of Google. And he makes the point like, you know, if we're awful and we train the AI to be awful, <laughs> we're in a lot of trouble. And so, you know, there's a lot of, again, you know, trying to, you know, uh, be model scientists and train scientific decision making because that's how we're going to train the AIs and then it's going to fall back on us. Anyway, I stop. <laughs> okay. yeah. So, a question regarding biodiversity here. And you have mentioned, and, that, and it's true that the major, major biodiversity is in the tropics, but we know also that in the tropics, the countries that are in the tropics are the, way, the less supported and the most affected, the forests in South America or the desert in, in the Atacama Desert. We, to all the, the biodiversity that we have there, and we don't know anything about it. So what's your opinion about that of the future or the direction of the research since even the institutions there are not well supported to study those biodiversity in the climate change context? Well, I think, you know, I mean, what, I mean, the good point you're making is that we need to, we need to include Latin America in all of this and, and all of the, you know, the scientific knowledge and sharing and there's efforts, there are efforts, but clearly not enough. Um, and unfortunately, with a lot of the political situations and kind of instability, a lot of, you know, really good Latin American scientists are fleeing Latin America to go to the United States and... Yeah, but I mean, yeah, it has to be. There's a lot of people working on that, but probably, like, there's a lot of people who try to include Latin American science, but not enough, not enough. It's still, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot more funding has to go.
the Matrix. Uh, like, thanks. So, uh, <laughs> I, so this is like super heavy, and I kind of need a breather. So, can we talk about development for a second? <laughs> um, so, my question for you guys is: um, Do you think there will be some um, part of development that is unifying in thinking about how organisms adapt or respond to um, these changes? Right? Because, or is this going to be like a species by species, stressor by stressor grind, right? To figure out like how every critter is. And, I, and I'm thinking of, um, just to kind of ex explain what I mean, I'm thinking like Gerhardt had this idea of the phylotypic stage being a constraint because you have to get to this common kind of um, uh, body plan and it has to be at the right time and at the right stage. So that could be where we look for like impact of environment on, say, a group of animals that have a common phylotypic stage. So do you guys think there will be something in, um, in development that can unify kind of our thinking across many different kinds of stressor and environment yes, and animal and system? Yes, no, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just go down like So that's a really good point, Amro. And I mean, I honestly think that it's there, different windows and different times. And, you know, Mary Jane West Eberhard has brilliantly written a synthesis of developmental plasticity and evolution, but we don't really, I mean, there's a strong theoretical framework. We don't really understand all the mechanisms, and that's where developmental biologists can come in and really work out, like, you know, the details uh, of developmental plasticity. But I think that is the unifying framework, and uh, that's just my bias, you know, as an eco evo -Devo person. And I'll say no. <laughs> because I absolutely agree that developmental plasticity is going to be a big part of the ability to adapt to an environment, but developmental plasticity is also highly evolvable. And so I would, I think that the, uh, there will probably be themes, just like in convergent evolution of any sort of trait, there are themes, but not necessarily a unifying principle. Um, and then also, like, I, you know, I put the evolutionist stuff happens because it's the probability of a genotype times the probability of an environment. Uh, the environments are going to be very different, too, because, like, we talk about aridification, like, parts of the planet will become desert that weren't, but parts of the planet are also going to become really humid and wet and flooded, and other parts of the planet are going to become icy cold and totally unstable with, like, super hot summers and really cold winters. And uh, so I feel like even globally, what species and populations are adapting to may be quite different by locale. We have one. I would like to offer the plan perspective here yes. again, uh, <laughs> one more time, right? So. Yeah. I miss this catchphrase that many of the plant papers start, you know, plants are sessile organisms, they can migrate, la di la, and they have to adapt, and it's true, right? And so most of plant development is post-embryonic, so it's plastic by definition. And if you have a tree growing in the wind, it goes into the wind. If you have a tree growing without wind, it goes up. And so I feel like that there might be unifying themes, but I don't think necessarily between flora and fauna. That might just, uh, I might be wrong about this, right? But then again, I think what you said, it depends on the stressor, right? And it depends on whether organisms can migrate or not. Um, it depends on a lot of things. I mean, there's definitely developmental biology might find important mechanisms to respond to stressors, but I'm not sure there is a big unifying concept for this is just too random. It's just, as you said, stuff happens, right? But those that make it may be the most plastic. Those that yeah, might be the most plastic, yeah, that's true, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not part of this, right, <laughs> as humans. We're not very plastic. So I, I, I would like to add that in developmental biology may be very relevant for some parts of the tree of life. Um, you know, and it may be very important to understand adaptation and so on and so on. But if we are thinking about, you know, ecologically, the global ecological crisis, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure that, you know, 
animals or even plants could be the more relevant, you know. Um, if you look at the more abundant organisms, uh, ecologically more abundant, they are not the ones that have developmental biology, they have development, you know. Um, if, if we think about the organisms that are more relevant for the global ecosystems, we don't even know them. We know for some specific ecosystems, but I'm not sure, I mean, we may be talking then about completely different, maybe prokaryotes, you know, as it was mentioned before or something like that. So I think it's a different question again, you know, it's whether we want to understand how organisms or vertebrates or things that we like adapt to climate change, that's one thing. If we want to understand, you know, how we could have better plants, that's another thing. But if we want to understand how the big ecological crisis can come, I mean, maybe we need to look in, into other organisms. Okay, so I have a, a question from Usha Kadiyalo, which I'm just sort of going to paraphrase, which is talking about, again, about thinking about uh, integrative or interdisciplinary biology and integrating data from field studies, population dynamics, genetics, molecular mechanisms, sort of where, how and, how and, and what are the, I guess, the uh, resources that we need to be able to integrate these things and how do we sort of approach that going forwards? Um, well, I think, you know, there, there's some remarkable efforts out there, uh, you know, f for example, like NCBI, like genome information, that's incredible. What we need to do that is replicate that for all kinds, like, you know, just repositories and databases for all kinds of, you know, uh, natural history information and, and, and developmental data. And there are, and I think there just has to be, and that, that, that in and itself, like trying to connect all those databases in a better, more efficient way, and I think uh, that's a that's a big challenge. I think that's at least a, something we can practically do. I think we all we need to do it, but yeah, but that would be, in my opinion. I mean, and maybe just quickly mentioning AI again, right? So AI, I mean, it's kind of scary, but it also holds great potential. And so I think we're going to look back to 2023 as a a revolution in in, in human technology. And so maybe actually AI can help us to find connections between seemingly very disparate uh, concepts and, and data sets. So maybe there is hope after all then. And on that note, I'll just, uh, we're not ending yet, but I just wanted to throw out in response to this call for consolidating and unifying data. Um, for those who work in or collaborate with people in the United States, the National Science Foundation has just put out a call for a new funding mechanism, which is going to fund, I don't know, it's two, five million dollars, something like that, to, uh, for proposals that will advance science by collating and synthesizing existing data, not producing new data. So if you agree with these points, then you should write one of those proposals because there's money for it right now. Okay, we have a question uh, from Michael at the back. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. Um, thank you also for letting me speak my mind. And I also tried to put my thoughts into an order, so hopefully it makes sense. <laughs> and I think you have raised some important points before when you, in, the, in the discussion, um, which concerns, for example, gaps between scientists, gaps between reviewers and scientists, um, the gaps between scientists and the non-scientists, for example, climate change or reviewer communes. And maybe regarding also that um, we're working on unconventional organisms and we want to put them more into light for biodiversity and climate change. And as we know, we also have different personalities, even also, I guess, at this conference, we also have different personalities. Um, so I was wondering what can we do even to start within the scientist's field to raise more awareness for this issue, because I also feel like we have scientists who also don't maybe believe in unconventional model organisms or even in climate change as well. And maybe a, a bit more like your thoughts on how maybe practically you could see this, how we can raise awareness, how we can put together all these personalities without interfering on the personal level. And, yeah, I think that's my question. Maybe as the prior creationist, I can touch on this, right? <laughs> um, we're really used to waking up one day and being 
kind of okay, maybe with a little bit of time, not one day, letting go of what we thought was true the day before, right? Like a good scientist faced with data will say, you know what? I thought that this was true yesterday and now I'm starting to change my mind about that. And we kind of have this idea that if we put data at other people, that they will respond the same way. And they don't. And then that becomes really frustrating because it's like, but I've shown you the data and you don't believe it and I don't understand how to communicate with you now. So much of what people believe is rooted in an identity. And identity is really hard to change. And so connecting with people on a level that's not, you have an opinion that I need to change, here's the data to change the opinion, but rather, who are you? Why do you believe what you believe? And having the sort of like, let's talk about it instead of approaching people like they're wrong and they just need to have their minds changed. Uh, and I think we could all, myself included, honestly, because you know I'm sure I've had conversations with people where I'm like, but, um, but you know, for some of these deeply held identity beliefs, it's more than just data. Kim, you make a, you know, an excellent point. And, um, you know, it's just hard. Like, if I, if I was to say, okay, I think the unifying theme is developmental plasticity, and somebody says, well, that's not what I work on, <laughs> you know? And so I'm not going to change what I'm doing just because you think, I mean, you know, it kind of goes. But I want to shout out also to, uh, in, that, in that thing, to, uh, sorry, to Monsi and Bob Goldstein. They recently put together a volume on uh, non-model organisms and it's a non-traditional, what was it, Nancy, what was it called? Emerging. Emerging, thank you, yes. I, I probably wrote the title about five times wrong. But the idea is, yeah, emerging models, and that was a great effort. And, and I really appreciate, I, I participated, I wrote a chapter, and they really let me just, you know, just say in a very relaxed style, this is how I came. As a scientist, do you want to be the expert? So then you should not have an opinion, or do you want to be an activist, right? And then you have an opinion, but then you're clearly an activist, and people will say, like, yeah, you're just doing it because you have your, um, uh, basically, your program, and you want to push for it. And I would have argued for a very long time to be expert, right, to provide experimental evidence and evidence-based uh, arguments for policy making. But I'm not sure whether this is the right way to do anymore, because we're in a fairly urgent situation. So maybe we have to be more activist um, than just expert. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, but I think this is just a choice we all have to make. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I seem, um, I don't know how to say it, but my feeling in the last years is that people outside science are doing more for climate change than people from inside science. And we should be aware of that. And coming back to what was mentioned before, you know, it's very, you know, and I was doing that until two years ago, you know, I was always saying this sentence, you know, basic science, and I believe in that, eh? basic science is super important, you know, we, we, let's see what it comes from that, and so on, and so on. But, you know, there is a point in with that, I don't think it's enough, uh, really. And, and I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, you know. You can ask Nuria, she was in my life. Very optimistic. You know, I, I always believe I will get the grants, I will publish the papers, and I will find the organisms I want, you know. Super optimistic. But um, my feeling is that, as I, I think more or less I said before, um, scientists, we should change, you know. Um, we are a little bit in a bubble and we continue to be in that and then we say things to ourselves so we are comforting, we can sleep at night and so on and so on. At, but at some point we need to do a change um, and if we don't do it, we, we will face the problems. Um, you know, as I said, my feeling is that people outside science are doing more for climate change than we are doing. Um, so that's the first. And I, I, I'm not sure we need to be activists or either experts. I think we need to do, we need to work in our expertise, you know, if our job, they, we are paid to do science and do things for science. I believe that, you know, taxonomy and biodiversity is a superpower. You just need one species and it can change completely the world, you know, if one single species for whatever reason, technologically, 
for food, for whatever reason. So I think it's very important to understand the diversity. But I also think many times, as Paula was saying, all this money that we are putting and efforts and plastic and so on, is it worth it? And maybe we should reconsider that. So I, I'm not sure we need to convince others. I think we need to convince ourselves. That's my feeling, my personal feeling. Um, the UN Climate Summit's in New York this week, and tens of thousands of people poured out into the streets to uh, demand that countries across the world do something about climate change. And we're here, and we're having these conversations, and they're really important, but I mean, I think we really should all start turning up for those marches when they're in our neighborhoods. Uh, just a random thought. Because, you know, I often think like <laughs> neuroscience meetings, there are like 20,000 people. And like, how did it get to be like that? We're like less than 100 here. And most of them work on the mouse. Right? So, I mean, <clears throat> like what makes it so that, you know, that's what we think is important. Is that decision made by scientists? Was it made by society? Who made that decision that they get to fill two convention centers? Well, you know, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I, I don't know, but I, it's kind of, I just wonder like how we place so much, I mean, I'm, it's important, you know, but this is important too. And obviously we're trying to, you know, we're obviously struggling. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to solve fundamental problems in society. They are too, but they've got 20,000 people. We've got a hundred, you know? So I'm just wondering how that happened. I don't have a good understanding, really, of the, the system and how those, those, those happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, yeah. I said that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. yeah, it was an in-joke. Tell us all. What's that in-joke? It's because we're a narcissistic species. Exactly. <laughs> that's the bottom line. And on yeah. that note... Just to put that on record, you know? <laughs> yep. Great. Wow, well this has been a really exciting discussion. Uh, just speaking for myself, it absolutely went in direction I would not have predicted that it went in, in a good way. I won't tell you what direction that is. <laughs> and uh, I really wanna thank uh, all of our panelists for uh, offering their you know, honest opinion. Only you know how varnished it was or not, but I really enjoyed listening to what you had to say. And I really especially wanna thank everybody here for all of your really exciting and thought-provoking questions. Um, and I guess I'll just end by saying that in the same way as collectively we have constructed the discussion that we wanted to have, and if you want to get more specific about that, the discussion that was had here was driven by the people who decided to speak. And in the same way, the science that we do and that we publish and that we fund and the decisions that society, which is not outside of us, we are also a society, those decisions and those actions will be made by all of you who also decide to take action on your beliefs, whatever those beliefs are. And so I'm very excited to see what sort of science this community produces over the next little while, given the discussions we've had here. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to Development and Company of Biologists for sponsoring this. Thanks to those of you uh, online uh, who are real people in the matrix for also participating, uh, tuning in, and contributing your questions. And with that, I believe we are free to view some posters in preparation for dinner. Thanks. <laughs>